This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? This week we're going to be airing part two of our interview with Dr. Rick Strassman. Uh, his new book is called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, and it's very different from the first book. Um, the subtitle is A New Science of Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Bible. I think it's a fascinating piece of work and uh, very unique. This is not something that's ever been investigated before. So I suggest approaching it with an open mind. Uh, he may very well be onto something here. And so we're just going to get right into this interview. And uh, I hope you find it interesting. All right, and we're back with Dr. Rick Strassman. And uh, your new book is DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, A New Science of Spiritual, Spiritual Revelation in the Hebrew Bible. And how many years is this in the making, Rick? Um, <clears throat> well, I started studying the Bible around the time my Zen community and I parted ways, which was 96. Um, and then the whole concept of the prophetic state began, you know, dawning on me about a year or two after that. So I began, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, notes for the project around 97, you know, 98. So oh. the, the book came out September last year. 2014. So, you know, a 15, 16 year project. Damn. Um, and you, you st now you were raised Jewish, am I correct? Yeah, I was raised, you know, Jewish, had a bar mitzvah, you know, learned, uh, you know, some modern Hebrew. Uh, you know, I studied the Bible a bit, you know, the first, you know, five books of the Bible called the Torah. But it was, you know, mostly, you know, cultural and, you know, hist and historical. Um, as opposed to uh, especially uh, a spiritual approach uh, uh, um, to Judaism, and you know, then I kind of you know uh, you know took this long you know detour through Zen Buddhism for over 20 years, uh, and then uh, at a certain point returned to my roots and started looking at the Bible. And and what did the Zen community have a problem with regarding your DMT research? Well, you know, there were a number of, you know, good things about my involvement with, you know, Zen study and practice over all those years. It influenced, you know, the performance of my study to a large extent. Um, you know, I had spent a, you know, summer, you know, learning, you know, Buddhist, you know, psychology with a Tibetan, you know, Buddhist um, as an elective in medical school in uh, the 70s. And as a result of, you know, that experience, um, I began, you know, developing the rating scale for the DMT response, you know, which I, uh, you know, which I developed and, and you know, which has been used, uh, you know, for other, you know, drug studies around the world over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, you know, uh, so it also influenced, you know, like how, uh, you know, we supervised uh, the drug sessions. Uh, I would enter into a, you know, light, you know, meditative state, uh, you know, to, you know, you know, to both, you know, be responsive, you know, to the volunteer and, uh, and the volunteer's needs, um, as, uh, w um, as well as, uh, you know, uh, um, staying responsive, you know, to my own inner, uh, you know, reactions, you know, to what was going on in the room and within myself. Um, and it also uh, was important over the years, you know, to discuss my interest in, you know, the psychedelic state with the Buddhist community. Um, you know, the vast majority of the young monks that I had met and kind of, you know, grown up with over the years had got their first flash 
um, of the possibility of an enlightened state of mind on LSD in their you know teenage or early twenty uh, or early twenties. You know, so you know, off and on over the years, I had you know you know been discussing you know my interest with them, and you know got uh, you know quite a lot of support uh, for you know thinking about speculating about you know you know the relationship you know between the psychedelic state and the meditative state and a meditative way of life. You know, so um, you know from the spiritual point of view, from the academic point of view, from the personal point of view. Uh, you know, from you know, the professional uh, you know, perspective, uh, you know, Zen was quite helpful. Um, you know, you know, but as you know, time went on, and you know, well, um, you know, well, you know, when the rubber hit the road, as it were, uh, and I actually, you know, and and I actually you know, began my studies, and <clears throat> then started writing about them. Uh, you know, that was a little, you know, too much, you know, for the orthodoxy, as it were, and uh, the community, you know, needed to, you know, distance itself from any, you know, possible, you know, like association between, you know, Buddhist practice and drugs. So, you know, you know, so at a certain point, you know, the politics, you know, kind of got in the way, you know, but also, you know, the, well, so, well, so also the data, you know, kind of got in uh, in another way at the same time, you know, because I was um, expecting an enlightenment, you know, like experience, uh, you know, formless, unitive, white light, you know, merging with, you know, the source of being, uh, you know, no personality, uh, you know, no thoughts, no images, you know, no feelings, no body, those kinds of experiences um, as a result of the high you know, dose of DMT, uh, you know, but on the contrary, it, it was quite interactive. It, it was as opposite, uh, you know, th- you know, to the enlightenment experience as one could imagine. And also, you know, the Buddhist, you know, model, you know, looks at the, the visions as unreal, you know, that they're just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the brain or the mind, uh, you know, kind of, you know, letting loose flotsam and, and you know, jetsam, uh, uh, you know, on its way, uh, you know, towards the, you know, formless enlightened state. You know, so uh, it was kind of a, you know, conflict, you know, to regard my volunteers' reports through a Buddhist, you know, lens because of their positing, you know, the reality of what they had just undergone, you know, versus, you know, the Buddhist model, which would posit, you know, the basic unreality of what, you know, they had just undergone. Right. Right. Okay. And you also looked at shamanism as a possible model to explain DMT as well. Right. Um, you know, I don't have that much experience with you know the shamanic model, but you know some, and I've studied it. You know, uh, you know some, and I've you know discussed it with practitioners and scholars. Um, you know, uh, you know one of the advantages of you know shamanism, especially the Latin American ayahuasca kind of you know shamanism that's making inroads into the West. Is you know their belief in you know the reality of the spiritual um, in in the in the spiritual world, um, it, you know that it, it exists you know parallel ongoing you know to you know this uh, you know world of everyday consensus reality, but at the same time they only look at the spirits. It's kind of a you know it's it's uh, you know kind of a you know um, it's more, you know, focused on the spirits and of uh, of the plants, the spirits of the ancestors, as opposed, you know, to a more, uh, you know, uh, you know, God-oriented you know, kind of model. Um, and I think any, you know, model that's going to be getting any, uh, you know, traction in the West, you know, needs to be you know, consistent with, you know, with you know, most people's beliefs. And uh, if it's an atheistic, you know, uh, you know, kind of model, um, I don't think it would be able to be as influential as you know one that you know you know took in 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 to account uh, you know the presence, uh, the activities, you know, the attributes of God. Um, if, you know, if, especially if you're going to be you know uh, speaking about this, you know, the you know, uh, you know the potential 
spiritual benefits of you know taking these drugs. So with this book, you're not. I mean, you're not coming out here and pre preaching religion. You're showing the, uh, the, the connection between the DMT state and the prophetic state in the Hebrew Bible and, and suggesting that this could be used as a model for what's happening in the DMT state. Right. Um, yeah, you know, so I you know, looked at uh, you know, the Zen approach you know, to the DMT effect. Um, I looked at, you know, there's, uh, um, and I also you know, looked at you know, the shamanic approach um, and, you know, they both, you know, kind of had shortcomings. You know, another, uh, you know, shortcoming of, you know, the shamanic model, um, at least, you know, the version which is, uh, you know, coming in, in to the West, is it, it seems, uh, you know, somewhat ethically and, uh, um, and, you know, somewhat, you know, morally you know, challenged, as it were. Um, you know, there's a lot of spiritual warfare, black magic, revenge, you know, killing each other. You know, there's murders of, you know, shamans, you know, happening quite frequently in uh, the Amazon. You know, rival shamans are killing each other. Um, hmm. And, you know, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the Western religions have their own, you know, set of, you know, violence-prone uh, individuals and policies and whatnot. But... Um, um, you would expect anyway, uh, you know, that an alternative model would at least, you know, be an improvement or wouldn't be, you know, any worse, uh, you know, than, you know, the extant, uh, you know, religious, uh, 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 well, well, you know, the extant religious models, uh, you know, which are current. Um, yeah, you know, so I started looking at the Hebrew Bible, uh, and I started to think about the notion of the prophetic state. And uh, I think it's important to, you know, define how I use the word uh, prophetic or you know, prophecy as compared, yeah. you know, to the usual use of the term. You know, most people think of uh, you know, prophecy as predicting or foretelling, um, you know, um, you know, but that is, you know, more of an artifact of how the Greeks translated the Hebrew word for prophet when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, uh, which was the first, you know, non-Hebrew language into which, you know, the Bible was translated. Um, and, uh, well, so the Hebrew, well, um, so the Hebrew word for prophet is Navi, N-A-V-I, and uh, the Greeks translated that as prophetes. Um, and, and, you know, so the Hebrew, you know, root of Navi, uh, means to communicate or to interpret or to be a channel. Um, it could also be translated as, you know, to bubble up, um, or even to be high, you know, like, you know, you know, kind of elevated high, you know, not intoxicated high, but, you know, like at a higher station. Um, you know, but the Greeks were interested in, you know, divination, uh, you know, well, as a uh, well, well, as their main you know goal of entering into altered states, uh, you know divination or foretelling, and the word and the Greek word prophetes means to speak before. In other words, to speak before something's happening. You know, so it's it's you know kind of an artifact of you know the Greek uh, you know fascination you know with with you know foretelling the future which ended up with the translation of Navi, which, you know, more means like an interpreter or a, a uh, you know, communicator from the spiritual, you know, world or from God, as opposed to foretelling. You know, so I, you know, define the prophetic state as any spiritual experience as encountered by any figure in the Hebrew Bible. You know, so um, like any inspiration, any out-of-body experiences, any... Uh, well, any visions or any voices of God or God's angels, uh, you know, foretelling can occur in the prophetic state. You know, it isn't a you know necessary you know criterion though, and you can predict without you know the prophetic experience. You know, like weathermen uh, you know, predict you know the weather with a you know, fair amount of accuracy, but that isn't a you know, prophetic state. I don't know. I think some people would argue how accurate the the weatherman usually is right right but, <laughs> but you know you know uh, yeah you know but they're right you know more times than not anyway 
<laughs> um, so, yes, so prophecy then is, in a sense, it's that communication state um, with something else. Yeah, I, well, it usually is a communication, but at the very least, it's an interaction. You know, so the interaction, you know, could be for the purpose of communication. Um, you know, no, you know, not necessarily, you know, but obviously the most, uh, like, enduring quality of the prophetic experience is, you know, the prophetic message, which is, you know, communicated in the prophetic state. Now, when you did the DMT research, none of their experiences were of the level of the Old Testament prophets. Um, well, I started off, you know, comparing the phenomenology of the two states. Uh, you know, the visions and the voices, the emotions, you know, the bodily sensations, you know, the effect on thinking, you know, the effect on will or, you know, volition. Um, and if you look at, uh, you know, side you know, by side comparison of descriptions of my, you know, volunteers' effects and the descriptions of, you know, the phenomenology of the prophetic, you know, figures in the text, they're quite, you know, similar. Uh, you know, there's a huge amount of overlap, you know, I would say 85, 90 percent. Um, you know, but still, when you stand back a bit and you, and you look at the impact of the prophetic experience as articulated in the Bible, and you looked at, at the impact of the, the volunteers' experiences, they clearly aren't as enduring or as impactful or as uh, profound uh, or influential. You know, so that got me back to the drawing board in you know, some ways. Um, and, you know, it's, it you know, kind of you know, began with my you know, thinking about uh, you know, one of the uh, with with you know one of the you know, phenomenological you know, properties of the, the two states, and you know that was a new category which I called relatedness, uh, and it would you know, kind of you know tap the interactions between the volunteer or the prophet and you know the contents of their visions, and and uh, the main you know function. Of, of the interaction in of the Bible is to communicate information. In the case of the DMT you know, volunteers, you know, there wasn't an especially large amount of in, of in uh, well of information, especially you know verbal information, um, you, know, you know which got communicated you know to them in that state. You know, so then I started looking at you know the information. Uh, um, you know, content, especially the verbal information content uh, of the DMT and the prophetic experience. And, you know, that's, you know, where the you know, prophetic state obviously stands, you know, hand and shoulders or, or you know, head and shoulders um, uh, um, above, uh, uh, you know, the DMT experience. And, you know, up until now, anyway, you know, the psychedelic experience in our culture uh, in well, in general. Okay. Um, do you? Th how much do you think the, the the cultural differences between that time period and now are shaping these experiences? Uh, well, I think to a large extent. And you know, if you look at the personality, perhaps of this like a you know miniature you know version of culture. Um, you know, I think it would influence the interpretation of one's encounter with spiritual realities. But I think it also bespeaks or would uh, influence, you know, you know, people's, you know, training and their thinking and you know, their beliefs. Um, you know, one of the uh, you know processes, or you know, one of the you know jobs in my new book. Is you know is is you know the development of a model of the prophetic state, uh, using the lens of both the existence of DMT, and you know that of the medieval Jewish, uh, you know commentators and you know philosophers, you know who looked at the Bible and you know developed a you know metaphysics of the prophetic experience, and. Uh, yeah, so those uh, scholars, you know, divided the 
well, they divided the mind in, into the imagination and the intellect. And the imagination is the part of the mind which, you know, contains, you know, the visions and the voices and the feelings, the emotions. Um, and uh, and uh, the intellect is the part of the mind that extracts information, you know, from those visions and those voices. Um, you know, so, you know, during the you know, time of, of uh, you know, the events of the Hebrew Bible and of the... Uh, and of uh, their being recorded and written down, you know, the mind, you know, set of those individuals was, uh, it was developed, it was, you know, primed, it was, ex- it was expecting um, <clears throat> those, you know, kinds of experiences, you know, so, you know, when they took place, uh, you know, the intellect of those individuals, you know, could ask, you know, sophisticated questions, you know, know what to ask, you know, know how to uh, understand the answers, you know, that were given to them. You know, one of the interesting aspects of the DMT experience, you know, was a problem in communication. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the volunteer would come back and say, you know, we just didn't speak the same language, or I was so afraid and so freaked out by encountering these beings, you know, that my level of anxiety precluded, uh, you know, good communication. Or, you know, the speech was, you know, garbled and I couldn't quite make out what the voice, you know, was telling me. You know, so, uh, you know, that isn't especially, uh, you know, common in the prophetic state. Or if um, or if it is encountered, it usually takes place um, in the first experience or two. And after that, you know, uh, you know communication becomes a lot more, um, you know, comfortable, you know, uh, I'm a lot, you know, more uh, clear and effective. Um, you know, so the intellectual, you know, preparation, uh, you know, foundation, as it were, of, you know, those entering into the prophetic state, uh, as described in uh, the Bible, you know, was an order of, you know, magnitude, you know, different, you know, than that which was the case in the DMT volunteers. Mm. And you're also positing that the these ancient people were not taking any form of hallucinogen it was it was uh internal it was natural yeah you know there are a few theories out there of you know those experiencing the prophetic state you know taking plants or drugs whatnot uh, you know some people have you know proposed cannabis um others have you know um, are, are, you know, proposing, you know, DMT in the acacia plant, you know, that was burning, you know, that, you know, Moses witnessed. You know, some people think about an ergot alkaloid like LSD in the mana. Um, you know, but I think, you know, that, well, you know, the existence of naturally occurring DMT, you know, you know kind of militates against, you know, you know, looking under every shrub or every, uh, you know, rock, you know, for some kind of psychedelic plant or substance. Um, um, you can speculate that, you know, t- you know, to the extent, um, you know, that the, uh, well, that the prophetic state, you know, phenomenology is comparable to which, you know, well, well, to that which occurs after an injection of DMT, you know, that there is, you know, some, uh, you know, common, uh, you know, biological denominator. And, um, yeah, you know, so I, I am speculating, uh, and obviously this is uh, extreme speculation, is, you know, that the concentrations in the minds or in the brains of the, uh, well, of, you know, people experiencing a prophecy in, in, uh, in uh, the Old Testament were increasing naturally, increased amounts of DMT occurring naturally. Huh. Do you um, also think that it has something to do with, beyond the prophetic elements, uh, with Jewish mysticism and the mystical experiences that rabbis have? Um, The mystical experience that what? I didn't hear that last part. Uh, The mystical experiences that rabbis have? Um, Well, the mystical experience, you know, the unitive... Uh, your mystical state, which I distinguish from the interactive relational one, um, okay. isn't really described in the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, there's you know one you know reference to you know Moses entering into a cloud on top of Mount Sinai, 
you know, but other than that, that's you know, like one you know single verse um, out of you know the entire text of a you know potentially you know Moses enters into a cloud, um, you know, but everything else is interactive. There's speaking, there's talking, there's arguing, there's being protected, there's being harmed, there's being informed, there's predictions, uh, you know, there's teachings, you know, there's law, there's wisdom. Um, yeah, you know, so the Kabbalah, uh, and, you know, the rabbis, you know, who developed, you know, the Kabbalah, uh, were interested in, you know, kind of, you know, merging with God, uh, you know, you know, like a mystical experience in which, you know, case, you know, the personality of the experience is, is obliterated in a you know union you know with God and well and oftentimes an ecstatic union with God, um, right? And if you look at you know the Hebrew Bible, you know prophecy is anything but ecstatic. Uh, you know the lowest you know level of you know prophecy is you know um, is inspiration, <clears throat> and uh, inspiration is what influenced you know David, uh, uh, you know who composed the Psalms, and you know the Psalms. You know, um, are the only, uh, you know, consistent, you know, part of the text which, you know, describes ecstasy or joy uh, or, you know, like, uh, you know, blissful experience. You know, so that's kind of, you know, uh, you know, that's, you know, kind of, uh, you know, low down on the, you know, rung of the, you know, prophetic ladder. You know, the rest of those people experience, uh, experiencing a prophetic state, um, you know, it's intense. It's anxiety provoking. You know, lots of you know prophets. You know, don't like being prophets. They're not you know seeking it in particular. Uh, you know, the message can be kind of gloomy, and as a result, it can be depressing. You know, for the you know for the prophet. You know, so you know most of the you know, figures in the Hebrew Bible, especially at the beginning of their you know, prophetic you know mission, um, it you know comes on in an un you know, bidden kind of way that, you know, they really don't, you know, want to become, uh, you know, imbued with, you know, the prophetic uh, spirit, um, as opposed to Kabbalah, you know, where, where, you know, people are, you know, doing specific exercises with the specific um, intent uh, of right. attaining a unitive mystical state. Hmm. Do you think that there could be, um, I want to say a natural cause, but like, um, for instance, uh, earth energy or cosmic energy that hits people and increases a production of DMT. Um, well, that could be, you know, uh, what you, well, uh, you know, clearly, uh, with respect, you know, to, you know, to the prophetic state, you know, there's a, you know, great emphasis on uh, the land of Israel, right. uh, you know, and, you know, and, you know, some of the you know, medievalists uh, would, you know, teach, you know, that, uh, you, you know, that you can only experience, you know, the prophetic state in Israel, you know, because of, you know, the nature of the land, um, and specifically, you know, Jerusalem, and specifically the temple, and specifically the Holy of Holies in the temple, you know, you know so there seems to be a specific, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, uh, you know uh, a specific, uh, Influence of the land, you know, the, and you know the, and uh, the, and uh, you know the geography, which you know seems to uh, play a, uh, you know, some you know role in uh, in uh, the experience of prophecy. Okay, and I and I would think the the prophetic state is probably less like the DMT state you did in the lab, um, in nature. And more like maybe a UFO contactee experience where there's actual communication going on, where they're um, able to communicate, there's interaction, so on and so forth. Uh, and it seems real to them, just like the, the state of prophecy did to, to the people back then. Yeah, well, you know, there are, uh, you know, well, uh, well, there are a number of, you know, features which, you know, do overlap between the prophetic, the DMT state, and, you know, the abduction experience as well. And, you know, one of them is the strong, you know, feeling of reality, um, or it's even more real than real. Uh, you know, uh, when you're reading, you know, the Hebrew Bible, uh, you know, everything else is uh, swept aside when, you know, somebody enters into prophecy. 
you know, the, you know, the transition um, is is a you know bit more seamless, you know, than occurs in a lab when you're giving a drug. Uh, right. But 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 still, um, you know, there's the yeah yeah there isn't any question that it is taking place. You know, like in uh, the beginning of a few of the prophetic you know figures, you know, mission, you know, they were uncertain. You know, like Moses when he encountered the burning bush as you know his initial theophany, you know, wasn't quite you know sure what was going on. He looked at the bush and it wasn't being consumed, and he said it's burning, but it's not being consumed. What's going on? And um, and in the case of uh, you know Joshua when he you know crossed in uh, um, into Canaan, um, he uh, encountered a being you know carrying a sword, <clears throat> and he said. Are you with us or against us? You know, he really didn't, you know, know what was going on. Uh, he was confused. You know, like, is this a real person? Is if it's a real person, is he, you know, like an ally or, uh, 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 or uh, well, or, uh, well, or uh, you know, like an enemy? And you know, some of you know the lower developed or you know the non you know canonical prophets uh, or you know individuals you know, you know that experience you know the prophetic state aren't quite certain if it's a person or an angel, you know, like the, you know, mother and the father, um, right. of Samson, uh, you, you know, was, you know, were confused uh, when, you know, they experienced a, you know, prophetic state. Uh, you know, they asked the angel's name, they wanted him to eat, uh, you know, they wanted him to, you know, to stay with them. And uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, well, uh, well, the being said, you know, uh, well, I don't eat, and I you know, have no name. And if you want to offer me some food, offer it to God. You know, so they offered it. You know, to this. You know, well, well, well. So they offered it to God, and you know, the angel. You know, then uh, you know went up to heaven in uh, the fire. You know, so it can be confusing. Uh, in the first few prophetic in, uh, encounters, you know, kind of like uh, would occur in the DMT volunteers. They weren't quite. You know, uh, uh, you know, well, you know, they weren't quite, you know, certain what was going on. You know, they had to get their bearings, and you know, then after a while, it became, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, clear that it wasn't a dream, wasn't a hallucination. They were actually uh, in some, you know, kind of, uh, you know, you know, so, you know, uh, well, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, they were in, uh, you know, some kind of. Uh, of uh, you know newly revealed world. How do you define God in this book? Um, well, you know, I began thinking about you know God within a Buddhist you know context because uh, you know that was kind of my you know baseline uh, for a spiritual you know system, um, and you can't escape you know the mention of God in the Hebrew Bible. You know the first, you know, sentence uh, in the first, you know, in the first, you know, uh, you know, book of the Bible, Genesis, is you know, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, you know, so who is God? You know, so you're confronted with the notion of, uh, 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 well, you're confronted with you know the notion of you know God early on, and uh, I think for a lot of people who read the Bible, and probably a lot of people who open up my new book. Uh, you know, find that the notion of God is a great stumbling block uh, because of their, in a way, you know, kindergarten view of the idea. You know, they were exposed to it as children. Uh, they didn't learn anything about it afterwards. And, you know, then as adults, they couldn't understand, you know, how their view of God, which was attained as children, you know, could make sense. You know, so I was in the same boat in a lot of ways. Um, but I also knew that if I was going to make any headway at all in the text, um, I needed to contend with the idea of God. So I kind of, you know, went back to my, you know, Buddhist roots, as it were, and uh, started thinking about, you know, you know, some of, you know, the God-like, you know, things, or, you know, or specific answers to specific, uh, uh, specific. Um, uh, you know, questions that weren't answered adequately for me in Buddhism. You know, uh, you know, one of the uh, main you know tenets of you know Buddhism is the idea of you know cause and effect or of karma. 
and uh, you know, cause and effect states that everything is you know now because of how things were before, and you know, things in the future will be uh, as a result of you know how things are now. You know, so you know, like I'm curious, and I was thinking, well, you know, was there you know like a beginning of cause and effect? Uh, and the you know teaching of you know cause and effect is everything begins and exists and it ends. That's you know kind of one of the you know basic features of karma. But at the same time, I was taught that you know cause and effect itself you know was eternal. You know that it had no beginning and it had no ending, which you know didn't make sense. Um, <laughs> so then I started thinking, well, you know there must have you know been a you know, beginning of cause and effect, and you know so that was kind of a toehold. You know, for me to start, you know, you know, thinking about God, like, you know, you know, perhaps, you know, cause and effect, you know, was created by God, and you know, cause and effect, you know, what maintains it? You know, you know, why is you know cause and effect, you know, continuing even today? And I thought, well, perhaps it is, you know, God that you know both created and sustains, you know, cause and effect. You know, so that was you know one of my toeholds, and and so another one of them. You know, uh, it's, you know, concerned, you know, why, uh, you know, cause and effect, uh, you, know, you know, seems to encourage certain things and, you know, seems to discourage other things. You know, like, you know, for example, cause and effect is a certain way. Uh, you know, for example, uh, if you uh, are, in a, if, if you're angry at, you know, somebody, it upsets your stomach. As opposed to if you're angry with you know somebody you turn into a refrigerator, you know you could explain, <laughs> you know well you know you could explain you know the mechanism you know by which you did uh, you know turn into a refrigerator after you became angry you know you could look at the physics and the chemistry and and you could explain it you know you know but it is the case if you're angry it upsets your stomach in in other words you know there's a certain quality of you know cause and effect, which you know is you know kind of designed to discourage anger. You know, so I began you know you know thinking about the moral and the ethical you know flavor of cause and effect, as it were. And you know that helped me start to you know think about you know God in a more clear you know kind of a you know manner. Well, well, you know, so the medievalist you know, speak about, you know, nature, you know, the natural law and the moral law coming from the same source. You know, so if you look at, you know, you know, cause and effect in uh, the natural world, um, it's only like a, you know, physical manifestation of, you know, cause and effect in the moral or the spiritual, uh, you know, world. Um, and, you know, if you look at the life of Abraham, which I've been looking at quite carefully the last couple of years, you know, like, uh, you know, Abraham was the first, you know, Jew, you know, you know, uh, and at the and at uh, the same time, you know, he lived without a written law um, because he lived before Moses, you know, uh, uh, you know, from whom the law, uh, uh, you know, was transmitted. You know, so you know, people talk about Abraham, you know, following the natural law. Uh, in uh, in other words, you know, he was able to deduce from observing nature certain ethical and you know moral you know principles, uh, you know, because they you know you know because they both emanated you know f- uh, you know from the same source, you know, that being God. Okay. Um, now, when when you sat down to compare these two states, how did how did you lay that out? Well, I first, you know, began with, you know, the phenomenology, you know, using the categories I had developed from my DMT research. And, uh, you know, the comparison was quite striking, quite strong. But, you know, there are, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, well, um, you know, but there are clearly differences between the two states. And uh, I began by, you know, developing that category of relatedness, which uh, then started to, you know, weigh the prophetic state, you know, more in your know, favor uh, in, you know, terms of its complexity and its, uh, you know, depth. Um, you know, so, you know, when I then, you know, began to look at, you know, the message, you know, content uh, of the two states, I kind of, you know, reversed the order 
and I, you know, develop, you know, categories, you know, from the Bible, uh, and, you know, then would, you know, look at the reports of my DMT volunteers and place, you know, them in, in, into the categories that I had uh, developed from, you know, looking at the Bible in, in terms of the message content. You know, so the message content, you know, is of the message of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and, you know, the two, you know, and, uh, well, well, the two, you know, uh, uh, you know, primary, you know, teachings is, um, are, uh, you know, the one God, uh, um, and the golden rule. In, uh, in other words, it's, you know, how you relate to the spiritual, you know, world and, uh, uh well, as well as, you know, how you relate to each other. You know, so everything else is a derivative of, you know, those two, you know, basic, you know, foundational ideas. You know, so, um, <clears throat> you know, there is, uh, you know, quite a bit stated in the Bible about God's characteristics and his activities. You know, so, you know, like God is, you know, kind, or, you know, God uh, is, you know, uh, you know zealous, uh, or is aware, uh, or is, you know, timeless, uh, those kinds of things. And if, you know, there were, and you're know, going through my DMT reports, if I, you know, found any uh, descriptions of a spiritual entity as, you know, being, uh, well, well, like as being, well, well, like as, you know, sharing any of those characteristics, you know, which the Bible, uh, you know, uses in describing God, um, I would bend, you know, those um, in, into those new categories. You know, so there's ethical laws. <clears throat> uh, and uh, you, well, there's wisdom, you know, like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Job. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, you know um, ethical empathy, you know, teachings which occur in uh, the text, which would you know crop up occasionally um, in my report, you know, in uh, the reports of uh, the volunteers. Okay, now did. One of the things you deal with in the book is the concept of the end of prophecy. Now, was there a point where people weren't having these experiences anymore, or were they just not accepted? Yeah, I think it's you know more the case you know that the latter uh, you know was true. Uh, I think you know that the rabbis you know declared an end you know to prophecy at a certain you know historical you know juncture, um, and you know that you know corresponded you know to the Roman occupation of. Uh, you know of uh well well uh, uh you know, well, <clears throat> well the roman occupation of israel at the time uh, um you know one of the you know functions of uh, the prophetic figure um is you know to confront authority and to be a rabble rouser and you know that was okay you know more um you know it, well well so that was okay you know more uh, more or less at uh, the time of, you know, the Hebrew monarchy, you know, um, you know, but it could be positively dangerous if you're in an occupied, you know, territory, you know, so, you know, for the Hebrews to be, you know, talking about overthrowing the government, uh, you know, kind of, you know, rising up against, you know, the Roman emperor, you know, that was, you know, dangerous, you know, so the rabbis, in, you know, some ways would, you know, then kind of rebrand, you know, the prophetic, you know, figures of, you know, their time, Um, in, you know, the context of, you know, not being, you know, divinely inspired, but, you know, being idiosyncratic or, you know, being political figures. Um, and also, I think it, you know, coincided at around, you know, the time of the beginning of, you know, Christianity. Um, it was, I think, in you know, some ways, it was intended to exclude, you know, the divine or, you know, the divine, you know, message out of Jesus. Um, um, you know, well, you know, which was occurring at around that time as well. You know, um, if uh, the rabbis, you know, could kind of, you know, disassociate, you know, Jesus, you know, from the, you know, from the prophetic stream, um, it, you know, was easier, you know, to, you know, disassociate, uh, you know, Christianity from Judaism. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Did you have anything, Luke? No, this is just very interesting to uh, talk about. Okay. Um, you also mentioned the, the difference between true and false prophecy. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a huge issue. And I think it comes 
you know, back to even the prophetic, or, you know, the psychedelic state, uh, you know, the contemporary psychedelic state. You know, like, how do you, you know, know, you know, that the state you're encountering is true or it's just increasing your own, you know, delusion uh, or you're using it, you know, for, you know, for, uh, you know, for your own uh, aggrandizement, um, you know, for power, uh, for influence, you know, for fame, those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, you know. So there were a number of criteria which were, you know, developed in the Hebrew Bible and the Middle Ages. Uh, you know, uh, which were used to distinguish between false prophecy and true, you know, prophecy. You know, but even those criteria were kind of fluid and kind of dynamic and inconsistently applied. Um, I think ultimately the main criterion which came down being used was. Well, you know, was whether or not, you know, the teaching uh, and the life of the person claiming prophetic inspiration was consistent, you know, with the Hebrew Bible's, uh, you know, morality and ethos. You know, so if you were, you know, claiming prophecy, you know, but you were, you know, and at the same time you were, you know, charging lots of money, you know, you know, to give your you know, prophetic utterances, you know, that would be inconsistent. Uh, if you were encouraging, you know, people to worship idols as opposed to worshiping the one God, you know, that could be an indication of a false prophet as opposed to a true one. Uh, you know, if you're, if, if what you're, you know, talking about is uh, primarily in, intended to you know, uh, influence people and make you rich and have sex with women or men or whatever, you know, that would be a distinguishing, you know, mark of a potential, you know, false prophet. You know, so you would, exp um, you, you know, so you, um, so you would expect them to be living a life and, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, promulgating teachings which, you know, were consistent with the text and, uh, you know, the commentaries which would extract, you know, the teachings from the text. Okay, how do you feel that this information, this 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 uh, sort of layout with the idea of prophecy in the Hebrew Bible, how do you think this will, should affect future study of DMT? Well, I think it can influence a number of you know fields of human endeavor, you know, both religion and of science. Um, within you know the scientific model. Um, there, there's a couple of things it could do, you know. Uh, you know, one is the specific kind of state which is being studied and you know held out as the ultimate you know, psychedelic state in clinical spirituality research. Um, and and um, well, uh, you know, there are uh, current uh, studies which are you know causing or you know which are interested in occasioning you know, mystical experiences in you know, research you know, subjects. Um, and you know, the gold standard for those studies is the unit of mystical state, as opposed to the interactive relational one, which is you know, the more prophetic one. Um, right. you know, and in the unit of you know, mystical state, it's nonverbal. Um, you can kind of come back and you know, talk about being one and being, you know, one with everything and everything is love and you can kind of make, you know, make it up as you go along. Um, but in the prophetic state, you're kind of, you know, saddled with, you know, the message that's imparted in the communication. You know, so in, you know, lots of ways, I don't, you know, uh, um, I, uh, um, I can understand, you know, that, you know, the mystical, unitive, nonverbal state would be, you know, more you know, uh, you know, would be you know more appealing, uh, you know, t you know, to the scientific mentality, which you know wants to, uh, you know, stay clear of of you know moral, ethical, and you know the resultant you know political you know kinds of issues you know that might come up. Uh, but but still, uh, I think uh, it's you know it it, it you know it is uh, you know kind of relegating the interactive relational state to a you know second class. Uh, you know, kind of uh, status. Um, you could at least, you know, look at the interactive relational state, and you don't have to call it 
uh, and intermediate states on the way, you know, you know, to the enlightened, you know, mystical state. Um, I, you know, think, uh, you know, that, you know, the emphasis, um, you know, on the mystical unitive state is kind of, uh, you know, hidden uh, influence of the east of the Eastern religious mentality, which you know, has infused you know the psychedelic you know, mindset in uh, the West. Um, and uh, and so another you know uh, 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 you know possible influence of you know my work you know um, um, within the scientific uh, uh, perspective is the whole you know field of you know how spiritual experiences. You know, take place. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, well, so, well. So the current, you know, model, you know, proposes you know that the brain, you know, generates the impression of a spiritual experience or of communicating with God. It is a reflex of the brain in response to you know certain stimuli like drugs or meditation or prayer. Um, right. And you know, that's what I call the bottom-up, you know, model. You know, so I am you know proposing a you know the model that I refer to as a you know top-down model. You know, which you know can incorporate you know brain physiology, brain imaging studies, you know psychopharmacology, you know, but instead of you know proposing you know that the brain is you know generating these experiences, you know my model <clears throat> is you know kind of countering that by suggesting that the brain is the agency through which God communicates with us, and the brain is you know so designed for that communication to take place. You know, so that's kind of a top-down model. Um, and, you know, one isn't meant to exclude the other, but I think, you know, they're kind of intended to, uh, uh, you know, bring a, 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 you know, theistic, you know, religious, uh, you know, perspective on spiritual, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, the study of spiritual experiences. Um, it, it, well, <clears throat> and the spiritual experiences are great, you know, you know, meeting point. You know, uh, you know, for science, and uh, um, you know, well, and religion. You know, because it's of interest. You know, to both fields, and uh, you can understand the experience from both a religious and a you know scientific point of view. And if he could, you know, merge them, uh, in <clears throat> you know somehow, and be able to enlarge the discussion to include. You know, both perspectives, I think, you know, that both perspectives are going to be rich or, you know, richer as a result. Um, okay. You know, in the more, you know, practical, you know, sense, I think, you know, you know, we'll, uh, you know to look at the Hebrew Bible, uh, you know, like as a possible, you know, key to interpret uh, the experiences that people have in their psychedelic experiences, uh, you know, can be useful. It's... Uh, it's a Western tool. Uh, it incorporates, you know, Western ideas, you know, Western words and concepts, you know, names, you know, narratives, ideas, all those things, um, as opposed to a shamanic or an Eastern religious one. You know, so you know, culturally, it's a lot more, you know, resonant, you know, with, you know, with the Western mind, and can I think, uh, you know, provide a you know, toolbox, you know, uh, you know. Um, which is currently missing from any, uh, you know, discussion of, uh, of using these, you know, compounds for their spiritual purposes. You know, like, you know, for example, if, um, if you learn about the different, you know, names of God, for example, um, you would be able to recognize, you know, those, you know, different characteristics of God in a, you know, psychedelic state. And if you weren't, um, you know, kind of cognizant of those, you know, differentiations. You, you might be baffled, you know, you know, by different manifestations, or you, or um, or you might not even recognize them. You know, you know, and you know, some of the you know recommendations for interacting with angels, which you know, um, you know, which occurs in the Hebrew Bible, could also be utilized in the psychedelic state. You could ask questions. You can introduce yourself in a certain way. You could beg their pardon. Uh, you can ask good questions. You can understand what they're saying to you in a uh, you know manner that might not be otherwise available. You know, uh, 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 well, to you if you weren't familiar, uh, you know, with comparable uh, you know phenomenology in the text. Okay. 
Have you have you seen much backlash from including a religious element into this work? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, some, some. Uh, well, um, you know, when the well, so, well, so when the well, so when the new book, you know, first came out in September, it you know, sold like hotcakes. Uh, but I think with when well, you know, when the word you know got out, you know, on that I was emphasizing the Hebrew Bible to the extent I was. Um, I think interest uh, flagged among those with a uh, you know primarily uh, you know psychedelic worldview influenced by you know shamanism or East or uh, more by East uh, more by East uh, or you know by Eastern religions. Um, you, you know, but as you know, time um, is going on. It's I think it's beginning to attract a more you know serious readership. You know, people that can kind of you know hang in there with me. As I explain, you know the reasons, you know, f- you know, for my turning, you know, from the science, uh, from you know Buddhism, you know, f- you know, from shamanism, uh, you know, to the world of the Hebrew Bible, you know, it's you know, it, it is some heavy lifting, um, and uh, it requires dealing with certain things which a lot of educated, uh, uh, you know, secular, you know, Westerners have a you know visceral. You know, kind of reaction against, you know, like the idea of God, and you know the and you know the idea of the Bible um, as a spiritual text. Um, and I expend a great amount of energy in the early part of the book ex- ex- explaining how I got from point A to point B, um, and the you know, possible uh, you know kind of stumbling blocks, and you know how I was able to overcome them. You know, so uh, you know, still it can be a you know, tough nut to crack for, uh, you know, for lots of people, uh, you know, without, you know, much, uh, you know, familiarity or, you know, comfort, you know, with the text. You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, um, you know, like along those lines, I am, you know, getting some, you know, thoughtful and evocative responses, you know, from the Jews out there and the Muslims and the Christians. It's, and, and uh, well, the Christians, in, is, you know, in a, well, in particular, you know, seem to be interested uh, in in uh, the new book. You know, uh, and I think this, and uh, you know, in uh, in particular, you know, the evangelical, you know, Protestants out there um, are you know extremely interested in this work. You know, but you know the you know the Muslims are interested in it. You know, the Jews are interested in it as well. You know, so it is you know beginning you know to infiltrate into the Bible reading you know segment of the population. Well, it, it definitely presents those passages in a very different way um, that I don't think most people have ever looked at them in that respect. I mean, there's been a lot of interpretations on that. Of course, you know, Ezekiel's wheel has been forever associated with ancient aliens and such, but you you make a completely different argument about it, and it makes a lot of sense. Well, good, good. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's some slow going going through the book, you know, but I think, you know, once I make the comparisons and began to speculate about what those comparisons mean, um, I think they appear in a pretty good light, you know, like it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's you know, kind of like, you know, the you know, key to understanding a lot of these, you know, things is under our nose, you know, like there's the Bible, um, as opposed, you know, to you know, to, you know, Buddhism or, you know, the Amazon jungle. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, you know, things which are, un- you know, which are, uh, you know, uh, you know, which are right in front of your face or, or under your nose are the most, you know, uh, you know, they can be the most elusive. And you're also not saying that people must convert to Judaism to understand the DMT experience. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but... I think, you know, you could appreciate what the text has got to offer, and you yes. can look into how people have interpreted the text, and one of the, you know, ways of interpreting, you know, the text is, you know, through the lens of, you know, Judaism. You know, like, I study text, uh, and that's my practice, and I like it, and uh, I am minding my own business. Um, you know, I... Uh, I'm not trying to convert anybody. I don't have a group. Uh, you know, it's kind of like an interesting uh, world. It's helped explain a lot of things which I had been, you know, puzzling about, you know, for most of my life. 
but um, I don't think that you know would would uh, you know necessarily translate as uh, a particular you know kind of lifestyle or declaring an allegiance to any uh, particular group one way or uh, um, um, or the other. Uh, you know, like I you know believe you know that the Jewish approach to the Hebrew Bible is the most cogent, but you know there are you know certainly other you know ways of looking at it. Now, do people still have these prophecy type experiences today, or do we just see the psychedelic type of experience replacing it? Well, there's, you know, uh, if you, you know, look at revival meetings and Pentecostals and whatnot, you know, uh, you know there are, you know, clearly altered states which are occurring. You know, uh, you know whether that's, uh, you know, form of prophecy, is it a you know, form of true or false prophecy? Um, you know, they're being possessed by, but, you know, what are they being you know, possessed by? So, <clears throat> uh, I think one of the functions of my book will be to begin the, you know, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sober, you know, you know, kind of, you know, critical, um, approach to studying the prophetic state. It isn't going to be, uh, some, you know, sidelight of, uh, you know, specific, um, you know, religious uh, groups that will be a, you know, larger topic, you know, for discussion within the, you know, scientific and, you know, religious communities. You know, so the whole, you know, question of <clears throat> uh, is there still, you know, prophecy occurring or, you know, like as um, the rabbis, you know, declared, you know, 2,000 years ago it ended. Um, you know, I think... Uh, <clears throat> The study of the spiritual experience using psychedelic, you know, drugs is going to be a great, you know, leverage point for a uh, more, you know, broad-based, open, uh, um, well, uh, um, a more, you know, broad-based and open, you know, minded approach, um, you know, to discussing uh, these kinds of uh, states and, you know, the role of DMT. I mean, you know, is clearly important. I mean, it's a compound in our brains and our bodies which, uh, you know, produce this experience of complete other worlds. And it's, you know, there all the time, um, <clears throat> you know, it's being uh, metabolized, you know, by the brain as brain food in, you know, some ways. You know, so any, you know, discussion of the prophetic state, I think, you know, needs to include DMT, and uh, if you're going to be experimentally, I guess, in, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, occasioning the prophetic state, you know, the psychedelic, you know, drugs are you know, going to be, uh, you know, playing any, are, are uh, well, well, you know, so they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, playing a role in the, uh, you know, within any, you know, discussion um, of, you know, the phenomenon. Okay. Luke, any last questions? Yeah, and you may not know the answer to this, but uh, have you noticed a difference in the response to how your work is received between uh, generations in terms of the older generation, perhaps my younger generation? Uh yeah, well, that's an interesting question. You, you, well, the majority of you know the older generation, you know, mostly, uh, you know, well, they kind of reminisce, uh, you know, like about their you know former experiences uh, in the '60s and of the '70s, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they, and you know, they like to tell stories. Um, you know, you know, some of them, you know. Uh, you know that are you know looking at you know my new book uh, are uh, you know um, express some gratitude you know that I'm you know presenting you know their you know their older experiences in a different context and uh, it's you know made them you know start you know uh, to, to you know think about the Bible and also to you know think about their you know, you know, they're older, you know, drug experiences in a different light. Right. Uh, you know, the younger generation, you know, they're more interested in, you know, doing their research. You know, they're quite, you know, keen on, you know, doing, you know, psychedelic research. 
uh, you know, that's always you know been the case in their responses to my first DMT book. But you know, now that you know that I've kind of ventured into the more spiritual and and you know religious uh, you know worlds, uh, I'm you know beginning you know to hear you know from philosophy grad students and you know religious uh, you know, studies grad students and you know some more of you know the academic religious you know world out there as opposed to the you know uh, purely psychedelic you know uh, 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 well you know psychopharmacology. Um, uh, you know, clientele or, or, you know, demographic out there. It's interesting. All right. Well, the new book is DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. And uh, the original book, of course, is DMT, the Spirit Molecule. you got a documentary out on that as well that came out in between. And uh, we were talking briefly, you have a book that you wrote some stuff for. What What was that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, you know, so I co-authored... Uh, you collected, you know, works kind of book called Inner Paths to Outer Space. Uh, it more, you know, focuses on the, you know, contact experience. Um, yeah, it was the brain, it was the brain, uh, 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 well, it, you know, was, uh, um, it was the brain, you know, child of a oncology researcher who um, was also quite interested in, you know, science fiction. And uh, he was interested in you know, getting the word out to the science fiction you know, reading community. And uh, also his name is Slavik Wojtovich. And uh, I also got Edward, well, Ed, Edward Luna to uh, participate in the book. And, uh, and um, so he uh, then you know, contacted a Hungarian psychiatrist colleague of his, whose name is Ed Frixa. You know, so, you know, so the four of us you know, uh, approached the entity contact experience from a number of you know different perspectives. You know, uh, you know, Dr. Luna, you know, from the ayahuasca perspective. Uh, you know, Dr. You know, uh, you know, Dr. You know, uh, you know, from the perspective of you know some of the ancient uh, you know, civilizations out there, and even quantum physics. And uh, you know, Dr. Boytowicz, you know, from the perspective. Of you know the science you know uh, you know uh, you know from the world of you know science fiction, uh, both you know books and films. Hmm. Okay. And what what does the future hold for you? Well, um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm really you know fascinated by the character of Abraham. Uh, he you know lived a prophetic life. Uh, you know, kind of you know uh, you know based on you know. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you know, based on uh, you know communicating with um, you know with God and with God's angels, um, and he also was a you know uh, a quite uh, you know keen observer of the natural world, which is you know kind of you know how he arrived at you know God in the first place, and you know he was a great teacher, um, you know he was a great you know, social activist, um, you know he, uh, you know quite a character. Um, <clears throat> And it, and you know so well so his life um, occurred you know like out of you know the context of any organized religion he you know kind of developed it as he went along you know but was inspired and constrained um, you know kind of guided all, you know all the way uh, um, you know like as a result of his uh, prophetic encounters you know so I think it would be quite helpful. Or of you know great interest, and it you know might not alienate you know you know my readers as much you know let's say if uh, I could you know take this material and you know fictionalize it in a uh, uh, you know compatible you know way with you know the Western mindset, uh, but include at you know, the same time a you know, psychedelic you know, mentality at least to the extent that the prophetic and you know, psychedelic states overlap. Oh, okay. So is that something already in the works? Oh, you know, I'm kind of a mad note taker, uh, so I just take notes of every you know thing I read, and uh, I've been you know kind of scouring the world for books on Abraham, and you know, and you know, there is a lot written. You know, there isn't as much written about Abraham as there is about the prophetic states. So you know, thankfully. Uh, it won't take you know 16 years, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, you know. But after a while, like I start, you know, taking so many notes, you know, that my brain starts to like break. 
So at you know that point, uh, you know, like I start to write. So um, mm-hmm. I'm still at you know the note you know taking phase, but I you know you know feel like I'm kind of uh, closing in on being able to attempt you know writing about you know you know this episode in Abraham's you know life and another episode in his life. Uh, so. Uh, you know, hopefully within a year I'll start writing and maybe get you know something out within a couple of years. You know, it it, it would be a, you know you know like a multi you know volume series. Uh, you know because of you know the uh, complexity of his life. You know, of like how long he lived, all of the you know things he encountered. You know, like you know Sodom and Gomorrah, and you know the you know sacrifice of Isaac. Um, right. You know Sarah, you know, Hagar, and Ishmael. You know all of those are you know really uh, quite jam. Uh, 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 well, you know jam. Uh, well, uh, well, so, uh, you know they're ex- extremely jam. You know packed with information and interpretation. So um, I think uh, I'll probably be able to recount what, like a couple episodes, you know, per book. So yeah, that might be like a hand, uh, you know, full of books, you know, that come out over the years. Huh. All right then. Well, yeah, I, I, and also, you know, there isn't really a good translation of the Hebrew Bible out there. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, one of the questions that I'm, uh, well, uh, well, 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 so one of you know the questions that uh, you know, that I receive every so often is, you know, is there an easy to read translation of the Hebrew Bible out there? And you know most of them are interpretations, or all of them are interpretations. But uh, you, you know everybody's got an axe to grind when they're translating the Hebrew Bible. So um, I think it would be of you know, value to you know put out a translation uh, of the text, which is approachable. Um, it, you know, you know it's um, and the you know main intent w- would. You know, would be to make the text intelligible, as opposed to uh, the main um, intent. You know, uh, you know, being to offer a specific, uh, you know, sectarian um, interpretation of the text. You know, so right. you know, perhaps after I uh, complete this Abraham, uh, 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 well, uh, you know, once I complete the Abraham, you know, project, uh, I may want to you know take a stab at, you know, um, you know, working on a, you know, friendly translation of the Hebrew Bible. Nice. All right. Well, I thank you for all this work. I mean, the, the new book is fantastic and so unique in its structure, not that the DMT, the spirit molecule, wasn't. Um, you've offered so much to, to people. If they haven't read your work, they really need to. Okay. Well, great. Well, I enjoyed our conversation and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, people will start, you know, reading more about DMT and the Bible and, you know, and, you know, thinking about what it all means. All right, and that includes our talk with Rick Strassman. And uh, next week, I believe we're going to have Steph Young back on talking about her new book, The Body Collectors, Chronicle of Stolen Souls. And uh, that is going to be uh, quite an interesting talk. The week after, I have Joshua Cutchin on talking about his new book, A Trojan Feast. And the week after that, we have Mike Cleland and Aaron Gullius back for part four of the history of the UFO phenomena. I will also be putting up a uh, midweek podcast, if it's not already up, with Joshua Cutchin, who, as I said, will be our guest in a uh, couple of weeks, as well as Michael Hughes and Summer Snape, as we talk about the uh, quality of evidence in the paranormal and what constitutes evidence and uh what the lack of evidence at times actually says about the phenomena itself. For that, you'll either have to go to our YouTube page or the website itself, wheredidtheroadgo.com. And remember, if you want to help us out, click on the links for the books uh, when you're buying them on Amazon off of wheredidtheroadgo.com. That helps us out. You can also send us a donation if you're feeling generous. All right, lots of interesting stuff coming up.